give some time for people to get on here in a little bit. <clears throat> we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. As I said today, we're going to start going in the New Testament a little bit. We'll be in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Very familiar passage, but some things I want to point out for you all, for you to think about today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 is where we are heading. Um, and it's an interesting section because I think it's one that we all know. Maybe not one that we all think about all that often, or maybe we'd rather not think about it. Um, and yet it's sometimes, I think, misused. So we're going to talk a little bit about all those things. So jumping into Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. All right, so again, very familiar passage, something that we've probably heard several times in our life. I know I've probably not only heard it in church or in studies, but read it and presented it many times myself. So that's where we're going today, Matthew chapter 6. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Vicki, Mom, Arliss, Connie. Uh, yes, so we are going in to talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, it is true that there are some people who have a very calm uh, caring disposition in their life. Um, they are not prone to anxiety, and maybe you know some of those people. Maybe you are one of those people, and God bless you for that. And then on the opposite end, there are people probably like myself and maybe you who are very much prone to anxiety, and uh, you are an anxious person by nature. And that could be for all sorts of different re reasons. I'll let the psychiatrists and counselors figure out all those reasons. It still remains true, though, what um, on earth do we actually gain from worry and anxiety? We might have a heightened sense of awareness or those type of things, but does it truly do anything by adding on to our life? No. In fact, um, I do believe, at least it was a while ago, the, the number one day for heart attacks was Monday, the beginning of the week when stress picks back up after a weekend and all those type of things. So we know that anxiety, stress, worry does us no good. Um, it might make us, um, I, I mean, maybe if you're an anxious person by nature, maybe it would be uh, calming for you. I know some people who actually thrive on anxiety and the like. But it doesn't really take care of the problem. It would be better to actually engage the problem rather than worry about it, but that's easier said than done. None of that really, though, it's the point of what Jesus is talking about. We, we hear, don't be anxious. Okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll just magically stop being anxious. Well, that doesn't work either. Um, the key, the point of this, and the point of our devotion this morning is found here in verse 33, which I think is the key to understanding this all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we first have to understand a little bit about kingdom, and we have to understand a little bit about righteousness. 
Um, something that I've been working on, especially the last few years, and I, I can't remember which person I heard it from. I know it was a, a fe fellow pastor, uh, challenged me and others, uh, it was at a conference, to think of kingdom differently than what we're probably used to thinking about. When we hear kingdom, we think knights in shining armor and princesses and jousting and all sorts of things like that. And we start to think of uh, land, kingdoms. Uh, good morning, Charles. Uh, all sorts of uh, a, a kingdom, a land, a realm. That's what we're thinking of. I would want you to. I would want to challenge you in the scriptures when you see Jesus refer to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I want you to hear it this way: the reign of heaven. A kingdom is no good without a king, or a queen, or whoever's in charge. A kingdom can't be a kingdom without the king. Um, and so really what we're talking about is the reign. God's kingdom is not of this world. Jesus himself makes this very clear when he's before Pontius Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. His followers are trying to make it a kingdom of this world. People today are trying to make it a kingdom of this world. Uh, denominations today are trying to make it a kingdom of the world. We're a Christian nation. We're this. Jesus says, that's, that's not my kingdom. My kingdom is, surpasses boundaries and all those things. And so when we look at this, I want you to hear reign. How does our Heavenly Father reign? It's different than other kings. It's not the same as a king who comes in a war horse to, to show that he has vanquished his, his foes and now you're his subjects and all these type of things. Rather, it's a king that sends his son to ride in, not on a donkey, uh, on a horse, but on a donkey, and the only time that the son ever looks princely or kingly or anything like that is when he has a borrowed purple robe thrown around his beaten shoulders and a crown of thorns and a fake staff in his hand as a scepter. That's where we start to see how God wants to reign. Not necessarily as this uh, glorious king who completely... Uh, zaps everybody whenever he's angry, although he can do that, and there are examples of him doing that. But one that rules in peace and patience and mercy. Um, and so once we hear kingdom of God, we have to remember that's what the kingdom is. It's how God chooses to reign despite everything else that's going on. So think of it that way. The second thing is, and his righteousness, okay? Now, there's one of those big confirmation words that I know we drill, we pastors drill into people's heads, and then we, even we as pastors, get confused on the term and interchange them. Righteousness is holiness. Uh, so seek God's holiness. Now, some people will say that means seek God um, by a holy life, but that's not what it says. It seeks his righteousness, his holiness. And where do we see God's true holiness come out the most? I would argue it's when his son is on the cross, and especially when Jesus says these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is a holy thing for our God to forgive, even though it is in his power not to. This is what we call grace. Grace is uh, not necessarily something you get. You get mercy. But the grace is the disposition that God has, that he says, okay, I'm God, I can do what I want, you have broken my law, you, uh, you have broken even your own laws, you can't even keep the, the, the things that you put in your life as gateposts and stuff, so what should, why should I ever have mercy on you? The grace is the disposition that says, but even though it's in my power, to do something to punish, I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm going to have mercy. And so that's the righteousness of God. Luther has this breakthrough uh, in his life when he stops looking at the righteousness of God as something that he has to attain in his life and looks at it as something that God has already attained and given through Jesus Christ. So now look, if we start thinking and seeking those things first, if we start putting those things as a priority in life, 
then the rest of the things will eventually fall in place because we have this thing called faith. And we know what God has given us is enough for today. This goes into the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. We believe that our Heavenly Father gives us all good things. This goes into the first article of the Creed, that I believe that God has made me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, reason, my members, and all, all my senses, and still takes care of them. He uh, protects and defends me against all evil. All of these things God does only out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in us or in me. I know some of your catechism translations are, are probably different than the ones I grew up with. Uh, but, these, but the truth remains the same. When we seek the things of God and his kingdom and what he has done, we start to also have faith that he gives us enough for today. Anxiety does go down as a, as a consequence of that. So Jesus here ends with, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, I don't think Jesus has any problem with you putting a list of what you need to do tomorrow, together, or anything like that. But be in the moment, be in the time um, of what you have to do, and the rest will come. We know there's problems. We know there's sickness. We know there's disease. I'm pointing towards my window over here. Can't quite see that. Uh, we know there's things out there. Uh, we know there's this COVID-19. We know all these type of things. And we will take precautions and we will do uh, reasonable, rational things. But we will also live by faith um, that God has our, his, uh, our best intention and his mind. This is his reign. This is his kingdom. This is his righteousness. So those are the things I want you to think about a little bit as you look through this. Um, nobody's going to add any time to their life. Nobody's going to add, um, you know, change the color of their hair on their head or in my case, gain hair back because my hairline's going back slowly as the years progress and all these things. Uh, nobody's going to change one thing simply by, by worrying about it. Maybe action would be better sometimes in certain cases. Um, but the simple anxiety, what it will do eventually, so let's, let's flip it a little bit, is go back to my analogy of idols the last time. Eventually, your anxiety and worry will produce an idol that you want to serve or worship. And, we're, and we all make little idols in our life. It doesn't have to be a metal or stone or anything like that. And the thing about idols, we don't like when people touch them. We really don't like when people move them, and we would just rather people not pay attention to them because they're ours. Um, and so we start our worry and anxiety. We will start making sacrifices and changes to appease that anxiety and worry. And eventually you can end up in a very rough and bad state, not trusting in your Heavenly Father. So that's the reason that Jesus brings this up. Another thing uh, that you should pay attention to if you want to... Uh, Take time to read Matthew chapter 5 and 6. This is all part of the Sermon on Mount. Most of your Bibles, if you have one like mine, that has red letters, you'll see at least a couple pages here of, you know, just red ink. Because this is all part of the Sermon on the Mount. It all flows together. So the Beatitudes flow into this, don't be anxious. Um, Jesus' teaching on morality and the like that we see in the Sermon on the Mount flows into this. Um, and all such things. So that's, that's another exercise that you can take uh, on your day if you want to continue on in your study. Um, anxiety has a chance to pull us away from our Heavenly Father and our faith. And that's what Jesus is warning against here. Rather, we want to see what God has already done for us. All right, well, that's what I have for you today. As I said, I want to take you through a, little, a few sections in the New Testament. So we begin with Jesus' words because beginning with Jesus is always more fun. Um, so we're going to, we began with some of Jesus' words. We're going to see what some of the apostles say, which is going to, uh, be reminiscent of what Jesus says as we go through this week. Any questions for you this, uh, for me this morning or prayer requests or anything that I can do for you today? You can type that down below and, um, I can try to field those as best as I can.
All right. Not seeing anything coming through. Um, again, reflect a, a little bit more on Matthew chapter 6 as you go through your day or your week. Um, one thing, uh, probably the best advice if you really do suffer from major anxiety and you're really worried about everything going on right now, best advice I can give you is turn off the news. Solves a lot of problems. Um, and I say that because, um, of course, there, news always needs to sell. And so the stories are always dramatic in some sense. They could be very true. I mean, we have this whole fake news and stuff like that. They could be a very true story, but they need to sell it to you. So uh, turn off the news and, um, you know, go out, I guess, social distance. Uh, I've talked to a couple of farmers out here just kind of waving, driving by, stopping by as they're uh, loading up seed or somebody was doing anhydrous out here a little while ago. Um, you realize that the world's not as not completely crazy, hasn't gone to complete hell in a handbasket and all those things. Um, and, and people are still people. Um, if you ever need anything, you know, let me know, give me a call, give me a, a message and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pray and we'll talk. So let's go ahead and pray for your morning and we'll send you off for your day. Almighty and everlasting God, we give thanks to you for this day. And we give thanks to you that you come to reign among us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as our King, who has had mercy and grace upon us. Help us always to remember that mercy and grace and your loving kindness, your loving kindness that provides for us each and every day and the promise that you will provide for us to all eternity. We ask that you be with those in need of our prayers this day, for those that we name in our heart and those that we, that we do not know of. We ask that you be with the hands of our medical care teams that care for the cases of COVID-19 throughout our land and throughout the world. And we also ask that you continue to be with those who face many economic hardships at this time. Continue to bless them and provide for them in ways that you know best. Help us all to turn to you and bring us soon back together as a body of Christ and church where we can receive your sacrament and where we can hear your word as brothers and sisters together. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, God have a God, God go with you this day, and I hope to uh, see you tomorrow. We'll be going into some of the um, the works of the epistles and the works of the apostles, and see what they have to say about some of these things. Have a blessed day. Bye.